from the Z. Alexander Luby Center Theater in Nashville, Tennessee. This is Just Conversations, presented by the Metro Human Relations Commission. Welcome to this episode of Just Conversations on DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, filmed here at the Z. Alexander Luby Theater. I'm Davey Tucker, Jr. with the Metro Human Relations Commission. I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves today. Uh, thank you, Davey. Uh, my name is Ben Tran. I'm an associate professor of English and Asian Studies at Vanderbilt University here in Nashville. All right. Uh, I want to push you just a little bit on that. and. Mm -hmm particularly because of the subject matter that we're talking about today. Tell me a little bit more about that and how it works into this conversation for us. That being my- That being your emphasis in being an associate professor at Vanderbilt. Well, I research and teach on colonial histories and how that's played out uh, since the 19th century onwards uh, in various contexts. Uh, it could be Southeast Asia, or it could be the American South pertaining to Asian Americans. Um, and so my concentration has to see how the racialization of the modern era after the Enlightenment era has affected our daily lives. And so I think about it, I research, and I teach about this quite a bit. Okay, thank you. I think that has a little bit more context for this mm -hmm. question. How do you view DEI today? Um, in the context of corporate governance, um, because oftentimes for me, I feel like sometimes it could be like the lead certification that developers <laughs> get for houses yeah. and they meet the minimum lead certification to put the sign up. Talk to us a little bit from where you said, what does DEI look like in the workplace and in society today? Well, I do think it's a compromised effort at this point. It's incomplete, obviously, and it's facing a lot of challenges, right? Obviously, with that too, with all the legislation that's coming down the pipelines in different states and so forth. Um, and it could be going backwards is how I feel about it. All right. Oh, wow. So it, it's almost like we showed up one day and DEI was the new buzz, buzzword. Mm -hmm. um, what made it popular versus companies actually embodying the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, how do you reconcile the two uh, of it looking good or having a program that is good? So I think it, it's, I mean, it's interesting to think about the actual three terms, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to think about the historical inflection points of those terms and why they're put together. So for example, if we look, if think about diversity, right? And if we go back to the affirmative action case of 1978 of Bakke versus the University of California Regents, initially affirmative action was a reparative notion, right? To make up for the historical, historical exclusion of African-Americans from American universities historically white institutions. But that was a split Supreme Court justice, right? And then there was one deciding vote. And one of the more um, influential decisions, right, or deliberations on that was Justice Lewis Powell's decision. And in that case, he did not accept the idea of the reparative mode of affirmative action for, through the educational system, through the university system. But he said, and this is where other justices kind of caught on to as well, that you could, for educational purposes, and a university could have, you know, according to the First Amendment, uh, the right to, you know, the right to figure out, to, to configure their university however they want. Mm -hmm. So you could have, for diversity's sake, like in education, the educational benefit of diversity, mm -hmm. right? So. At that moment in 1978, diversity become, takes on a different significance, right? Because you could look at or factor in race as one of many factors into admitting an, a student into your university. But it doesn't do the reparative mode, 
right? Or redress some of the historical exclusions of ed- the educational system in the United States that goes back to slavery, slavery and racialization and how we understand education. So then you have to ask yourself, if diversity doesn't have the social justice aspect of it, right? If its teeth have been taken out, then what exactly does equity mean in this sense? Or can you have equity, right? And then you continue with the next term, inclusion. And then you, and then you say inclusion for what purposes, right? The idea of inclusion for the, the educational benefit of diversity is completely different than working, for, working to address an issue that has been unfair and unbalanced, uh, systematically so, right, from the beginning of our country, right? And so that, that becomes compromised. And with the recent affirmative action case, some of the justices asked, what's, is there an educational benefit to diversity? Or what's the benefit of diversity, period? But when they ask that question, it's already a diluted notion of, di- of, of diversity and equity. And you're speaking of, of the recent Of the recent court. one, that's right. And Decision. so, like, for example, Justice Clarence Thomas was like, what's the point of, what's the educational benefit of diversity or what's the point of diversity? I don't, I don't see the, the benefit of it, right? So, so these questions that are, are at issue are the history of affirmative action and the per- political purpose of it, right, has been taken away. I, I shouldn't say political, but the, the social justice tenor of it or purpose of it has been taken away already. It's it's interesting that we've jumped, we started leaning into the DEI and you're framing this around the legal system, which I think ultimately guides us. But in this recent decision, uh, based on your explanation, uh, the recent decision says something to the point of uh, outright racial balancing is unconstitutional. Now, in the previous case that you talked about, were they not trying to achieve racial balancing? Well, that's interesting because in that previous, in the 1978 case, racial balancing could not be the only primary factor, just like they're saying now, right? But they're saying, but you can consider race as one of other factors in order to have the educational benefits of diversity. All right, so you're sitting in the classroom and you say, you know, your perspective, Davey, as an African-American person growing up in North Nashville, my perspective as the son of immigrants from, you know, from the Vietnam War, refugees from the Vietnam War, there's a benefit that the 1978 justices saw, right? Mm-hmm. But how that addresses other issues, that's not the case, right? And so there is a big difference. And the discussion, see, we tend to forget this, right? Because we, we tend to read these decisions as like, oh, is this about, you know, equity or not? Or how do we understand diversity? If we understand diversity as you being an African American and me being an Asian American as having living harmoniously and having, you know, equally minor, equal minorities, right? Then anybody can become a victim and that reverse discrimination that we're so afraid of. Is already there, but I think one of the issues that that we have when we talk about diversity and equity is that we for, tend to forget the history, right? That is behind this, like the context of it, like. And, and so I think that is part of the problem that we face today. You said earlier that um, DEI is compromised, mm-hmm. and when you say compromised, because you know you have Fortune five hundred companies. It seems like everybody has a DEI program. And so are you saying that DEI in general is compromised? And if so, give me an example of in practice in the workplace or in the academy that how it is actually compromised. Um, Well, I was saying that, you know, for me, the 1978 um, decision, Baki versus the US, UC regions, is a compromise, right? You're, right. You're, you're taking away the remedial intention of, of affirmative action, right, and converting it to something different. 
The other compromise is that we're not looking at the different histories, right? Mm. Like we, we are not, we are not, you know, the way that the U.S. government and its institutions have treated indigenous people, right, because we wanted their land is different than the way that we treat African Americans, mm. right, where we need the labor. But we needed the, the black slave to give birth to children so that we have more free enslaved labor. So the relationship with which we deal with indigenous groups and slaves is different, right? And we tend to forget that, right? That, that in itself is compromised. So just to have representation on a board, right? Let's have one African-American. Let's have an Asian-American. Let's have an indigenous person. Let's have a Latino person. Does that, does that representation, yes, it helps. Absolutely, it helps, right? But it helps because it gives different perspectives, right? But this is like the educational <laughs> benefits of diversity, right? Mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a boardroom uh, benefit to having diversity. You have different perspectives, different experiences. And, you know, I, you know, I worked in the restaurant industry and you work in the filming industry, the media industry. And I, you know, I work in Asia. Uh, so, yes, those perspectives. Does that really get at the systematic inequities that still confront us today, right? That prevents women from being promoted uh, to higher executive positions, or you know, what is the difficulties of ha of a person who's a first generation Latino or African American or Asian American who enters into the academy? How hard is it for them to climb the ranks or understand the culture of universities, right? It, how do we get at that? Just by having representation doesn't necessarily mean that we address that. Absolutely, it helps, right? But do we really get at the root cause or the root issues, right, that are historically grounded somehow, right? So then today, as workforces tout this thing and move toward it, uh, I saw a stat from um, a headhunter organization that said that in the last 12 months, they're down 50% on requests for DEI-related um, professionals. So do you attribute some of that to the recent um, Supreme Court ruling or um, some news agencies have covered that um, organizations are scaling back on DEI efforts. Um, what do you attribute that to if this is so important for us attempting to recognize some things that were wrong in the past and trying to create processes and models going forward? How do you interpret this uh, recent trend that seems to be um, a scaling back of DEI initiatives? Yeah. I don't, well, we do know that the question with the most recent affirmative action cases, and what other sectors besides higher education does this apply to, right? And we don't know enough legally how this will all play out, right? And how, how the repercussions are, how the wake of, of this new decision will come out to bear, right? But what I do think so I, I don't know, we, we haven't had enough time to kind of figure all that out, right? You know, there were some uh, people who are already saying, you know, corporations, you should pay attention because what is being said about higher education also applies to you. Now, how that works out legally and so forth, I don't think we understand or why companies are scaling back, I don't know. And I think the question is, in, in what respect do these questions of race go back to profit? Right. And because we, we've talked about slavery already. Right. And so obviously, right, you racialize a group and deem them black so that you can enslave them. Right. And treat them like chattel. Right. And so it's interesting to me that, that it's framed that way. And if you look at some of the, it's interesting because deep into some of the bills that are being passed, let's say in Florida, right, is this idea that the public university system is to serve the purposes of business fundamentalisms that are beholden to business interests, 
right? Mm -hmm. And so what, what exactly does that mean? Or how do we think about that? I mean, I think those are really interesting questions to me. So if you were to put together from your academic background and uh, the particular worldview that you occupy, uh, what do you see as some major issues or subjects that a good DEI program would cover and talk about? Because I keep hearing you talk about the history uh, as being critical to this thing right now called DEI. Mm -hmm. So what would that program, just in the 30,000 foot view of what would that entail as far as subjects? And for, I mean, as far as subjects, you would have to understand whatever organization or company this is, what the inequities are, what, you know, what are the vertical um, spaces that you have to overcome? That, what are the barriers that you have to overcome? And to address those in an open, self-reflective, honest way that you have to talk about race and gender mm. and class, mm. right? I mean, you have to, I mean, it's, it's hard, right? It's hard because, you know, I know that for me, you know, being an Asian American kid in the South, when I, even to this day, even though I'm a professor now, even to this day, if I enter certain spaces, I kind of have to, I kind of shut down a little bit. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't act the way I want to. So it's, it's, you, but what is that psychological gap or leap? And what are the structures, what are the hierarchies that are implicit, that are not said, but that are enacted, right? That seem like they're race neutral. Right, right. Right. So, I mean, so for example, I mean, uh, Justice uh, Jackson, Kentaji uh, Brown Jackson brought up a, an interesting example in UNC. So if you have two applicants, right, with this new affirmative action case, and one is a, uh, an applicant whose family has been living in North Carolina since before the Civil War, right? And for generations, that student has been, his, his or her family has been going to UNC Chapel Hill, for example. And on the application, the student says, I want to go to Chapel Hill because of my family tradition and legacy. That's race neutral. I mean, there's nothing that signals race about that, right? But if you have an African-American student, right, applicant, who's been, whose family has been in North Carolina since before the Civil War, but has been enslaved, right? Why is he enslaved? It's because he's black. His family's black, mm -hmm. right? So in that application process, right, if we can't talk about race, right, then that black student can't explain. Like, and he says, I want to go to, I want to be the first in my family to graduate from UNC Chapel Hill to fulfill the legacy of my family in North Carolina. Same thing, legacy, tradition, whatever. Right. So it seems that race, it always turns back into race. What? Well, it turns back into race. Of course, there's then, race, it, it, gender, yeah. class. Gender, yeah, class. Right? Yeah, and, but and all these things. Right. And. But how do we get. How do you understand that? So for a university, the challenge is, and I think this is what university has been trying to do, is how do we factor in the African-American student's story, right? Because if, you, if we go on legacy and tradition, right, that it seems race neutral. Mm -hmm. It's a given that it's, it, it sounds like it's a, it's a given, it's how the country is operated, right? It sounds like a great story. But it's not the same. Right. Because that right. black student has never been included Yes. And so the legacy student has an advantage. Absolutely. And this, and of course, it goes back to segregated schools, the availability of a school bus, the availability of textbooks, the availability, you know, public versus private schools, who can afford what, you know, black, you know, this black, black families were rare. They couldn't buy houses. They could, you know, they, they couldn't establish mm -hmm. equity through a mortgage. The list goes on and on and on. Right. But if you only see the black student and the white student, or let's say, you know, one of the things that, that fascinates me, 
is that in this affirmative <laughs> action, most recent affirmative action case, we don't talk enough about the Asian American students on which Ed Bloom filed the case against, right? And basically it says that Asian Americans' equal protection under Title VI is being violated, mm -hmm. right? But the, it's interesting because it is in some ways pitting Asian Americans against Black and Latino applicants. But that history kind of is a false equivalence in the sense that it makes us, like we're all harmonious, right? And you're Black, you're Latino, I'm Asian, right? And we're being equal, and you're taking my spot. Right. And because I'm Asian American, my spot is being taken. Again, the histories of, right, each group is different. And within Asian Americans, it's different, right? Mm -hmm. Refugees who came after the Vietnam War are not as established or don't have, you know, the, the economic or social capital that a family who's been in the United States for a long time might have, right? So in that case, it's, let's say it's just class. Hasn't had the same educational opportunities, has to work a second job, you know, as a janitor, waiting tables, whatever, right? So those things are, it's different. Uh, and we need to treat these, I mean, that's the thing is that Back to your original question, how do we do this? We have to figure out the histories that are keeping us unequal, unfair. Uh, you being an academic and seeing all the uh, anti-wokeness, as it's called, um, talk a little bit about CRT that's become the big boogeyman, and it seems to be the antithesis to any claim toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. So you're right that critical race studies has become this blanket term for anything, any field, or anything that studies critically race and gender, right? Um, but I think it misses a couple of points about critical race theory, which uh, the scholars who work on that was basically were basically asking, how come since the civil rights right, movement, have we not been able to, like, become more equitable, right? So let me just, for clarity there, critical race theory looks at the period of time beginning with the civil rights movement. Well, that's the question, right? Mm -hmm. That's the question, right? Yeah. Like, so why are, we so why are we still incarcerating so many African Americans, disproportionately so, in, in our society? Is a, is a question, well, you know. Um, why are schools still segregated? Why are they becoming more segregated? What's gentrification all about? These are the questions that the scholars of that field have been, have been asking. And so it's not the, this blanket, like, anti... I mean, it has a particular intellectual slant, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is being unfair... It's the unfair boogeyness of it all is that it's like this personal attack where we're making you compelled that you should personally feel guilty for your privilege, your white privilege. No, we're looking at the systematic issues mm -hmm. at hand. So no one is, go I don't, any sensible, you know, critical race theory scholar is not going to look at some student and say, oh, you're personally, you should feel guilty for what you've done. That's not the point, right? That, that assumes an innate sense of whiteness that critical race studies is looking at the social construction of race. So why right. the fear? Uh, why the fear suddenly of something that's been around for a while? What is this fear, in your opinion, tied to? Well, we do know that it, this came after the George Floyd demonstrations, right? And then the Project 1619 New York Times project, right? And so those two were, were like the, the catalysts, right? The, the, the two tipping points, you could say that caused this. Um, it's interesting because we're always asking, like, what's the value of education? What can, you know, how can kids get jobs? Well, obviously education is having some effect mm -hmm. and books are having some effect because we ban a lot of them, right? We're very afraid of what education could do. And, and you're right. And so I, I think that the thing that makes me sad and disappointed about the fear, right? And we could see this with Trump's um, executive orders of, you know, against div divisive concepts, right, is that I think what's happening is that 
with globalization, right, with gentrification that gentrifies also white working class and lower class folks as well. Right. right? Is that the message that I think is being sent is, is if you are marginalized white working class, we used to have this, this is the whole point of make America great again, right? We We used to have this harmonious good life with our fields, our benefits, our great country, all these things, right? And then these anti-racist people come in and they're teaching our kids this ideology, right? That is making us lose, right? Or feel marginalized, right? Rather than thinking about privatized healthcare, big pharma, right? The cost of housing, right? Why, you know, investments in housing, Mm -hmm. why housing has gotten so expensive the deterioration of public education, the de- deterioration of public health, the deterioration of public services, mm-hmm. right? So what you're doing is that you're turning, and this is like, like, you know, like after the reconstruction and the failures of reconstruction is you're pitting, not like in, back then it was the white non-land-owning working class folks against the newly freed slaves, All right? They were both landless, both trying to make a living, right? But how do we pit one against the other, right? To reinstate kind of what we had before slavery was abolished. So, so would a, a good DEI initiative seek to bring those two groups together in their commonality to maybe see what they share, uh, beyond color or the lack thereof, um, if that's one of the areas in there that becomes problematic. So do you address that? Do you, uh, I'm asking you um, from where you sit, what would that look like? Um, How do you tell the poor white that they're not losing anything if the poor black uh, gets this job or or this position, and also the same way, you know, on the gender issue. And I know we've spent our time on this issue around race, and I and and I think that may even be um, one of the larger issues where gender disparities are there, and they are equally uh, as important, in my opinion. But we spent a lot of time on race. Yeah, I think it. I think it's it's interesting because the fear of reverse discrimination is so great, right? That if you let this or that group advance, then they will turn the tables on us, right? I mean, I think this was most obvious when when Obama was in, and then like the the whole trope of like he's going to come take our guns, right? It's like that's that's the fear, mm-hmm. that's that's the fear, right? And so the the racial division that is being created among workers or students or people who are trying to get their kids a public education is not there, right? And we somehow have to show that, right? And, but that's, that's not a, a particular DEI. See, whenever you ask me DEI, I don't know what, are you, I'm like, is it a program within a yeah, company? Yeah, yeah, is it, yeah, is, is, it yeah, yeah. is it, is it yeah. a, a university? You know, is it recruiting? How does it work? You know, all these things, you know, I mean, I think it's interesting, right? Because one of the best recruiters is the U.S. military, Yeah. right? Like, <laughs> if I had my druthers, I'd tell universities, go recruit like the U.S. Army. Go to like right. the far-flung places all everywhere and, and get these kids excited. Put up commercials where like, you know. Looks like we're getting ready to run out of time. Mm-hmm. So I, I just want you to f- uh, close us out by uh, talking and surmising your comments around what does it look like going forward for all of us in this area? And what are some of the requirements? Well, I think going forward, the idea that we go race neutral is not neutral, mm-hmm. right? We're, we're like colorblindness or race neutral considerations, right? What exactly are we sustaining and continuing to do? The other thing is that, you know, for me, and maybe this is because I'm an educator, but so much of this is happening on the educational front. Like, what is it about education, right, that, that is so threatening this way? 
Uh, and that means that a large part of this is about the interpretation of history. How do we understand it? How do we teach it? <clears throat> and what we do with it, right? Wow. And then the other aspect, I mean, to get back to your corporation company, is how does this work or benefit or how is it related to business interests? How is it beholden to it, right? And what kind of classes are we creating? And not racial class or gender or anything, but like economic classes, right? Like, what does this perpetuate? How does this provide labor? How does this provide people who, ha you know, it breaks my heart to get a Lyft drive, driver who's like, has her grandchild in the back seat driving on a Friday night, yeah. right? When her, her daughter or the mother is working somewhere else and the grandmother with the child is driving. Like, what has, how has that been created, right? How, why is that the mother not living off of some social security and, or a house that she's paid off, right? So it seems to me that we got to keep asking the right questions and be brave enough to, pop, to ponder and reflect on what those answers are. I would like to thank Dr. Tran, Associate Professor at Vanderbilt University for joining us in this uh, engaging conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also would like to thank the Z. Alexander Luby Theater for hosting us. If you'd like to watch this episode or others, please, uh, you can find us online at justconversations.org. Thank you for your time.